Hello, it's Ruby, and today I'm going to be filming my annual what I read this year. I always love filming this video, but I'm always so conscious before filming of how long it's going to take. Honestly, it always takes like two hours, so I'm not going to talk about every book for ages, even though I would love to. Um, if you do want more in-depth reviews, I filmed monthly roundups from January through to July, I believe, um, where my reviews are much more comprehensive. And actually, for that reason, I'm going to structure this slightly different from usual and I'm going to start with the books I read in December and move backwards because the books that I read in the last six months of the year I'm going to try and talk about in a little bit more depth simply because I haven't done full reviews of them. My New Year's resolutions are mostly based in like daily habits and habits that I want to get back to doing every day or to start doing every day so things like journaling, reading as soon as I wake up and also making sure to take the symbiotic plus by ritual every day i've mentioned this before but i do get gut problems sometimes honestly i'm always on the lookout for something that can help because gut problems aren't fun and that is where this comes in and ritual is very kindly sponsoring today's video so i started using these at the beginning of january and um my goal is to just keep on consistently using them i've been taking these every day i feel like it's too early to say for certain but i haven't been getting an upset stomach as much basically it's a three in one so it includes probiotics prebiotics and postbiotics prebiotics are important because they contribute to the production of beneficial bacteria in your gut probiotics are live microbe organisms and they can relieve bloating and then the postbiotics strengthen your gut lining basically you take one of these every day and it also tastes like mint which is good because nobody likes um a katsu which does not taste very good the big thing though is the ingredients and what it's made of number one most important it's vegan so many multivitamins so many um tablets and capsules aren't vegan um but this is and there are no kind of colors and additives which are just sneakily added into the capsule. The website is incredibly transparent about what's included um, and you can look at how all of the ingredients are sourced. Definitely gives me peace of mind because I like to know what I'm putting into my body. Also the packaging is made with eco-friendly materials and it's all carbon neutral. In line with the new year, Ritual is offering a 40% discount if you wanted to try this and you can also scan my QR code if you want to be taken directly to the website. Um, but thank you so much Ritual for sponsoring today's video. As I say, I'm going to be taking these all of this year. So final book I read of the year, Soul Food, Nourishing Poems for Starved Minds. Somebody recommended this to me and so I took it out of the library and ended up buying myself a copy and also Blake knew a copy. This is a beautifully cur curated collection of poetry, translated poetry as well as English poetry spanning from the 16th century all the way through to like noughties and these are just deeply emotional poems about what it means to be human what it means to live it's um they're poems for the soul as the title suggests i would say this is a good book if you're trying to get into poetry and if you like those slideshows on tiktok you know all of the um the sad quote slideshows on tiktok if you like those and you'll probably like this anthology i also read oxford and oxfordshire in verse by antonia fraser i read this over the whole of my first term and just dipped into it. This is a chronological poetry anthology and it takes a different theme for each letter. This is a thematic alphabetized poetry anthology so um, it goes through from A to Z and uh, you know C is, is Christchurch or um, T will be tutors and then it finds a poem which ascribes to that alphabetized theme. Um, it's a really interesting way of curating poetry and I'd say this is a good one if you're visiting Oxford or you enjoy Oxford as a city because I, re I really enjoyed reading these poems whilst I was sat in Oxford because you recognise the imagery so intensely. I read Catch Your Death by Ravina Guron. This was actually for a sponsor post, I will first of all say, um, but Ravina Guron wrote one of my favourite books that I read this year actually, This Book Kills. Both of these bo books fall into the genre of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, those school-age 
murder mysteries which are just really really clever um so if you liked one of us is lying if you liked a good girl's guide to murder this is definitely one you will enjoy it's about a group of 17 year olds who are snowed into this massive mansion and their host ends up getting murdered and they're trying to work out what happened. I read Decadence and Catholicism by Alice Hansen. This is one of the main books that I used when writing my final essay for one of my modules um, because I was writing an essay on Anglo-Catholicism. Published in 1997, it's the first book to really draw a link between the decadence movement at the fin de siècle and Catholicism. So many of the decadent writers, Oscar Wilde, Lionel Johnson, um, who else? Um, Anna Stelson. Uh, so many of them converted to or almost converted to Anglo-Catholicism and so Ellis Hansen is thinking about the relationship between the two modes of thought and how they actually are very similar and um, unpicking the Catholic imagery which appears in so many of their texts. Then I read How to Do Things with Books in Victorian Britain by Leah Price. This is I want to say the leading book on Victorian bibliography, meaning the study of the history of the book, the book as a printed object. Um, it talks about book objects and uh, the kind of uh, so-called bibliomania uh, which struck Victorian Britain where everyone just was obsessed with how books looked. Um, I am fascinated by this as just a mode of study because I love books as physical objects. This was really enlightening, I really enjoyed it. I read Incurable, The Haunted Writings of Lionel Johnson, The Decadent Eras. Dark Angel. Lionel Johnson, oh my goodness, is the most underrated poet of the 19th century. I shouldn't go as far as to say that because um, I'm definitely going to be missing somebody, but I'd never heard of him before um, reading the Decadence and Catholicism book by Ellis Hansen. But he was um, an Oxford based writer, um, friends with Oscar Wilde, friends with um, many of those who ascribe to the um, aesthetic movement, and uh, he was highly revered, highly respected whilst he was alive, but then he died very young. Um, he struggled with addiction and he, um, his poetry kind of drifted off into oblivion, which is always kind of absurd to see when you've, uh, and it happens so much, where a writer is very respected at the time and then their writing after they die just isn't, isn't remembered. Lionel Johnson is otherwise out of print apart from this anthology, which only recently came out. Um, I definitely recommend reading this. Uh, you can only buy it from this small publisher's website. He's just excellent and please just like if you walk away with one thing from this video go and read Lionel Johnson because it makes me so sad that he's not respected anymore. It's tender, it's beautifully written, it deals with these Cartesian questions of like the boundary between the soul and the body um, and it's it's deeply moving, it's, re it's really heartfelt. He was a reclusive poet, um, he never married and um, there's this deep solitude to his work um, and loneliness, uh, but also deep affinity for his faith. Uh, it's just, it's excellent poetry, please read it. I read The Soul of Man Under Socialism by Oscar Wilde, a very short essay. Oscar Wilde is always a joy to read. Uh, this is his defence of socialism and why communism, why socialism is a politically good move. And essentially Wilde argues that capitalism doesn't allow for art to prosper in the way that it should be able to prosper, um, which is an idea which you definitely see um, emerging amongst the aesthetic writers and the decadence movement um as they look back to you know the renaissance or before where art wasn't so tied to making the public happy or kind of creating a product which could easily then be sold like a commodity uh, he, he's basically talking about how socialism is really important if we're going to create good art um i also read paris stories um collection of stories which goes chronologically from, I want to say it starts in like the 15th century and then it goes right up to a pretty modern day, uh, like definitely 21st century. All stories that in Paris, most of them are tran in translation. Um, I love the Everyman collections, like I trust their curators so much. If you like Paris as a city, this is a good one to read. I read The Story of the Glittering Plain by William Morris, it's one of his, oh wow that's very dark. Why is that so dark? This is one of Morris's late prose romances. Alongside his poetry, alongside um, obviously his art prints, he ended up writing 10 romance novels, like medievalist novels in the 1890s. This is one of them. Um, and this is what my essay was on. So that's why I read it. Honestly, I don't think it's like, I wouldn't actively recommend it. If you're interested in medievalism and how the Victorians 
um, became obsessed with medievalism, um, then maybe it's worth reading, but I probably wouldn't read this purely for pleasure. Well, I wouldn't read this purely for pleasure. I read Samson Agonistes by Milton. This is largely theological, of course, um, it's taking a biblical story and adopting that. The poetry is beautiful, like Milton's poetry is always beautiful. It's, it's political theology and it's thinking about the overlap between politics and theology, deeply morally I, I was going to say ambiguous, but it's more than morally ambiguous and kind of boils down to this question of what does it mean for someone to receive a vision from God, to be given a message from God, to um, possess a biblical prophecy, kind of what are the implications of that. I read Salome by Oscar Wilde, um, of, again based on a biblical story. It's a play about the biblical story of Salome and Herod, kind of Salome working as a siren of sorts to seduce, control and manipulate. If you like Wild, it's definitely worth reading. It was highly scandalous at the time, it wasn't performed. I read The Grave by Robert Blair. Oh my goodness. Just a moment for this book, please. It's a poem really, but um, I read this giant illustrated edition uh, with um, these uh, engravings by William Blake. I'd never heard of this poem before. Tell me why this poem is not on like GCSE and A-level syllabuses, why this is not at the forefront of reading lists for university, why we don't talk about it, because it's just, I have no words. Um, I was crying reading this. Um, those poems that kind of, they just, um, you know, uh, Dickinson says that you know something's poetry when it chills you to your bones and nothing can warm you from that. That is this poem. It's a lament on death, what it means to die, and it starts with this very real palpable fear of death um, and goes between different kind of members of society looking at like um, a king and then a handmaid and then a child and how each one of them on the precipice of death is just as afraid, um, the, kind of the equalising nature of death. But then it takes that fear and it transforms it into a kind of like pious biblical narrative um, and even though I'm not Christian, it's so beautiful. The way that he's able to take the same moment and transform it, like it literally is a transformation. I'm gonna say read this if you like Milton, read this if you like Blake, if you want to feel something very deeply from a poem. Then I read a book which I started in 2022, but didn't finish. I'd read like half of it, um, put it to one side, completely forgot about it. It's The Bullied Brain, Heal Your Scars and Restore Your Health, a psychological book about the effect that bullying and abuse has on your brain. Really interesting research, uh, unpicking the lasting damage and effect that it can have on your brain, but also how um, recent psychological research showed that you can kind of retrain your brain. And I read this because I'm interested in childhood bullying and the impact of that, I think it's a really important, serious thing for us to take heed of. So often it's just sunk to the side, it's like, oh, it's just bullying, it's just a part and parcel of childhood. And that's not a good way to think about bullying. Uh, next, the William Morris manuscript of the Odes of Horace. I read this for the beautiful illuminated manuscript. So it's kind of, it's split into two books. You've got the English translation and then you've got the Latin manuscript, which he illuminated. And William Morris, if you didn't know, loved medieval manuscripts. He actually, oh my gosh, this made me so angry when I found this out, but he bought and collected um, manuscripts at auction, like 13th, 14th century illuminated manuscripts. And then he would cut them up and put them in guard books. Can you believe that? Like he was scrapbooking with these priceless medieval manuscripts. Um, but he was fascinated by by um, the process of making them and he tried to adopt the same techniques. And so he would create these, um, these manuscripts and he would sometimes give them as gifts. I think he made one for his daughter, um, but they weren't commercial products. They were uh, just kind of for more for the craft of it, um, fitting in with the arts and craft movement, of course. Uh, I also read The Collected Letters of William Morris, specifically volume three, which is 1889 to 1892, because that's the period um, in which he wrote the story of the glittering plane, which, as I say, I wrote my essay on. Then I read Oxford Notebooks, A Portrait of the Mind in the Making by Oscar Wilde. Um, this is um, so, so, so great. Um, if you are a fan of Oscar Wilde, this one's for you. If you want kind of a, an insight into his education at Oxford. So while he was at Oxford, he kept two notebooks. He had a commonplace book um, where he would write down little notes from books, from lectures, uh, from conversations. Then he had a notebook where he'd write down thoughts. He's th it's thinking about Oxford 
uh, and the kind of the influence that this had on him, how his education then informed his later work and what things he was drawing on in his later work. Um, I found it really illuminating and I'd recommend it. Then I read Notes from Underground by Dostoevsky, which is going to be in the top 10 books I read this year, of course. This isn't so much a story or a narrative as an accumulation of different thoughts, like more than it being plot based, it's an emotional narrative capturing like the solitude and the depression, the compulsivity of the narrator. So depictions of mental illness and it's just, it's beautifully written. It's so, so moving. If you want something sad, if you want something that's going to make you cry or if you want something which is going to make you feel something, then read this. Um, the idea of the underground is like him as a narrator, he feels like he's underground and like the whole world is happening above him but he can't quite reach up and when you go into the underground you get stuck. Then um, I'm not really going to talk about uh, these books in so much depth at all. If you want me to talk about them maybe I'll do that in a separate video. A few like complete books on uh, Shakespearean criticism. Um, so I read Shakespearean Textual Theory by Evelyn Gajowski. I read Rethinking Theatrical Documents in Shakespeare's England. That was very good. I read Scribes and Sources, Handbook of the Chancery Hand in the 16th Century. I read What is the Book? The Study of Early Modern Printed Books. Pedag um, Performing Pedagogy in Early Modern England. The Formation of the Child in Early Modern Spain. Making Meaning, Printers of Mind and Other Essays. This is Mackenzie and his work is exceptional. If you want to learn more about bibliography, this is definitely one worth reading. Um, actually, regardless of your period. And then Circumstantial Shakespeare like by Lorna Hudson, which is very very good, Lorna Hudson is, is fab. The Real Thing is a short story by Henry James, it's about this upper class couple who approach the artist narrator and offer to model for him. So you've got this kind of wonderful moment um, and it is very amusing because they come in uh, you know very well dressed um, and very sure of themselves and they pose it completely as this huge favour to the artist um, because they know the stigma associated with modelling. We thought that if you ever have to do people like us we might be something like it and it talks about how beautiful him and his wife are and their value as artistic objects but essentially it turns into a question about what does it actually mean to be a muse? Does an artist just kind of paint paint a model of something and paint it exactly or is it about interpretation? We, we kind of like later in the story we compare uh, them as models to this other person that like raises all these questions about what does it mean to be a good muse I guess what is the nature of a muse and also art um, at a time where muses were in demand I suppose I'm not actually that big a fan of Henry James's work personally I don't really like his writing style I enjoy the stories and I enjoy moments of his work but um I, and I, I really just can't put my finger on what it is exactly, I just don't really enjoy reading it. On the surface he ticks every single box and I love his and I, I love much of the work of his contemporaries, I like the stories, I find it intellectually interesting, um, but I just don't really like reading him. So let me know if you're the same or if there's an author like that that you're the same with. Then The Gorgeous Nothings by Emily Dickinson, these are her envelope poems and I actually, I read it in the library but then I got a copy for Christmas. So basically it's scans of her envelope poems. Um, it's a wonderful piece of editorial work. Kind of, they're all done to size, so you can really get a sense of um, the kinds of paper that she was writing on and also draw connections between the type of paper, the size of the paper and the content on the paper because sometimes there are wonderful similarities there. Like in her um, house poem, it's kind of a poem all about um, being in the house and it's written um it's written on a piece of uh, an envelope which re resembles a house um and there's also this one about uh capitalism uh very loosely very vaguely and it's written on the back of an advertisement for something which is just so so clever i have a commonplace book where i write down little quotes from books i read and i did print out some like here you can see i've got little printouts of some of the poems in this book um, but I love this. But are not all facts dreams as soon as we put them behind us? Godfather Death by Sally Nichols uh, was sent to me. It's basically a rewriting of the Godfather Death story, uh, which is 
um, a classic fairy story. Honestly, the standout feature here is the illustrations. As you can see, they are gorgeous and um, I love the gold detailing too. It's a haunting story and if you're a fan of fairy stories, then this is definitely worth reading. So then I read another book by Henry James. Uh, this was a novel though, it was The Sacred Fount. I think it's one of his shorter novels. It's about a group of people who travel to Newmarch, which is this country estate. The narrator is very introspective and uh, basically observing everyone at this party and trying to understand the relationships between them. Um, again, I love the premise of it so much and it is do it and it is very clever, but I just didn't enjoy reading it. And then I read one other, this is, I did read this in like before time started, but I also reread Roderick Hudson by Henry James. So I read three Henry Jameses this year, despite not being the biggest fan of him. And Roderick Hudson, I did at least enjoy more than the first time I read it. So it's narrated by a patron, uh, this uh, man who is rather wealthy, wealthy and he doesn't really know what to do with his wealth. He wants to be a philanthropist but he doesn't know where best to put his money and he decides that the best way to spend his money is to become patron to an artist and he finds this man, Roderick Hudson, this young man who is creating sculptures and he sees as very talented so he decides to um, kind of sponsor him to move to Italy to learn from the great artists and thus to create art and so the narrator kind of sees his role as um, being important in the eventual production of the art, um, which is also an interesting commentary on kind of what, um, who is the artist and how many people infiltrate on, on the artist, like is the artist a singular body? But yeah, things basically just don't end up going the way that the narrator wants them to go and Roderick Hudson doesn't do what he was expecting. I will leave it there, but actually this is the, this is the best thing that I have read by, by Henry James, it's the one that I have enjoyed the most. Then I read, um, Chekhov's stories from 1889 to 1891, so it's volume five. Um, no specific reason why I read volume five. I've read a few short stories by Chekhov. They had kind of like all of the volumes of his short stories in the library and I kind of randomly chose this one because looking through the titles they look of the short stories these looked interesting um, and I did really enjoy them. It's always hard to review short stories because obviously there isn't just one single narrative. Much like Dostoevsky, the writing is introspective, it's clever, fairly sustained attention to ideas of youth and aging. I'd recommend this if you want to read more Russian literature but you don't necessarily want to like commit to reading the big classics. Then I read Gradavia, a delusion and dream in Wilhelm Jensen's Gradavia. It's a psychoanalytic reading of um, Jensen's Gradavia book and I did read both of them but the edition that I had, had like Jensen's book and then it also had Freud's commentary afterwards. Jensen writes this story about this man who becomes obsessed with this statue. No, not a statue, it's like a, uh, a, preserved, a preserved body from Pompeii and he becomes obsessed with her. And then what Freud does is he psychoanalyzes what this means and like what this obsession means and what it's harkening back to and uses it to explain his psychoanalytic approach, so it's really cool having both of those in tandem. I read The Allegory of Love, A Study in Medieval Tradition by C.S. Lewis. We were doing a week on allegory um, and learning about allegory and how early modernists used the uh, kind of concept of allegory and uh, C.S. Lewis had written this, um, and I am a fan of C.S. Lewis's uh, theological writings, so I just thought I'd give this a go. C.S. Lewis says that allegory is very, very inherent to humans and the way that our brains work. And I'll quote him as he says, it is the very nature of thought and language to represent what is immaterial in pictorial terms. Next, Burnt Coat by Sarah Hall. This is set during the pandemic about an artist and um, her lover who, like they're self-isolating during the pandemic. Like, it kind of just becomes them two as their own small world and the rest of the world doesn't really exist. That makes it sound so bad, honestly, but it's a very introspective book. I'd recommend it for people who liked Mona. Circe by Madeline Miller. I had wanted to read this for so long and not that I put it off, but you know when you don't want to read it because you know that once you've read it, you've read it and then you can never read it again for the first time. Because um, I loved Song of Achilles even though it took me so long to get into Song of Achilles. I love how Madeline Miller really utilises the humanity of the Greek gods and um, kind of, well, that humanness that makes them so appealing. I know, and just kind of weaves in so much Greek mythology and so many wonderful references and it becomes this exercise in seeing how much you can, 
you can unpick and you can understand so anyone who loved Song of Achilles, anyone who likes the Greek myth retellings, definitely read Circe. Yeah, I'm sure that you have read it though. If you like Greek myth retellings, of course you've read Circe. Madeline Miller's writing is just so lyrical, um, and lyrical writing is my favourite kind of writing. Then The Colour Sense, Its Origin and Development, an essay in comparative psychology by Grant Allen, which was an attempt in the, at the fin de siècle to define colour and scientifically understand colour, um, and what it means for some, for, like, for like something to have a colour um, and uh, kind of what impact and what effect psychologically colours have on us. Um, obviously this is debunked like kind of pseudoscience. I just love essays which were written in the 1890s because people wrote so beautifully and even though it's a scientific paper it's it's still kind of aesthetic in its style and um, it's joyful to read and um, he kind of goes through these long lists of colourful objects for example there's like a Dickensian abundance yeah I'd recommend it just because it is it's 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 well written it's it's nicely written if you like um Oscar Wilde if you like uh you know decadent literature um then this might be something worth reading or if you're just interested in colour in the 1890s and how colour was seen oh, this is another book of criticism I read The Unfinished Book uh which is um again a book of bibliography and thinking about the history of the book and book theory like there are so many essays it's a 500 word book storygraph is telling me um so quite a li quite a lot of essays and they're all quite short um but definitely go through the index and just choose one or two I love the one on the history of bookworms for example like the actual animal of bookworms there was also one on bookworms as uh kind of an insult and how readers want to be trusted in the um, 17th century because um, because they were too focused on, on books as opposed to the world outside. There was one on book objects or um, what do they call them? Book looks, um, objects that look like books but aren't books. You know when you have like boxes that look like books and it's uh, thinking about what uh, how the book is operating in that in that situation. There's one on uh, Derrida which is really good, there's one on commonplacing, definitely worth reading if you're interested in book theory and you want to learn more about it but in a uh, kind of a self-guided way I suppose. This is a good one. Sight and Song by Michael Field. This was so good, I loved this. This is a poetic gallery so it takes paintings from all over Europe and Michael Field writes a poem for each of them to describe what happens. It, there are no pictures at all, it's literally just the poetry. You get this great uh, interplay between, well, sight and song, kind of showing how an artist or a critic of art can turn one medium of art into another medium of art and whether you can kind of retain what was in the original thing when you transfer it. I love what it's doing and I think formally it's very interesting and I did love the ones on the, uh, there's one poem in here on La Pieta which is just excellent and speaks to a uh, kind of personal interest which um, Michael Field had with the image of La Pieta because they lost a sister and um, that was something I did quite a lot of research into or I kind of started to theorise what the nature of that interest in the Pieta was which I could talk to you at some point about if you're interested because Michael Field really hasn't received much critical interest. Um, if you're a Victorianist, if you want to, if you're looking for someone to focus on, Michael Field might be the one. Okay, I'm back. My camera battery ran out of charge yesterday and so I wasn't able to finalised filming. Uh, but back into the books I read. So the next one was Hauntings and Other Fantastic Tales by Vernon Lee. This is a collection of short stories and all of them, um, as the title suggests, are about haunting and ghosts. Not in a mid-Victorian uh, kind of a Christmas carol sort of way, but rather kind of hauntings of the past and the idea of the past layering itself on top of the present. Um, it's, it's kind of uncanny um, and if you're interested in progressions of time and what it means for us to leave the past behind then this collection might be for you. It was published in the 1890s. Then I read Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. This had been on my reading list for so long I can't even tell you. So it's um, based on Shakespeare's son Hamnet and looking at Shakespeare's domestic life. It kind of very much in line with Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own or Carol Ann Duffy's The World's Wife. It's really cool to see um, this kind of uh, stereotypical male genius 
well he was a genius but um set as the background to a character because in the narrative of hamnet shakespeare is first and foremost a husband and a father and he goes away from the home to london in order to perform the plays but that's not really a part of his identity when he's at the house um and so it's really cool just having that new perspective and um, exploring like the multiple identities of, of historical figures. Um, also heartbreaking and really sad and beautifully done and um, links it into his uh, kind of writing of Hamlet very well. Then I read The Island Princess by John Fletcher which is a play that I read for um, one of my modules. It's a typical colonialist uh, play narrative which was quite a popular genre on the early modern stage. It's a play about jealousy and also otherness. I read The Critic as Artist by Oscar Wilde which I loved. Honestly the amount that I cite this, the amount that I quote from this is ridiculous. Um, I wrote down so many quotes in my commonplace book and um, it's outlining Oscar Wilde's aesthetic theories, his theories on art, what it means to be a critic of art, and um, the whole thing is kind of a Socratic dialogue. It's a dialogue between Ernest and Gilbert, and they're talking about um, what it means to create good art, what it means to engage with art. And um, Gilbert represents this uh, very intellectual view, which says that something can be good art, whereas um, Ernest says no that's that's false and through the Socratic dialogue format we're uh, guided to kind of uh, think about art as important in terms of emotion and effect and the really fantastic thing about this is that it's written to that end so it's it's written as a piece of uh, beautiful kind of poetry prose um, and so vivid and so much of it you just sit there like kind of just looking at it thinking how on earth could someone write something this beautiful but that's you know Oscar Wilde to a T um, and on the same grain as that is Walter Pater's The Renaissance uh, Studies in the Art and Poetry of the Renaissance which was so popular that Yeats called it a bible for, of sorts for the um, undergraduates who studied at Oxford under Pater in the 1880s or 1870s. This is a series of essays looking at um, like really significant painters and movements in art and um, exploring why it's significant and it was such and this book is one of the most seminal books for uh, aesthetics theories at the um, fin de siècle. I would highly recommend that again that's going to be in my top ones for this year. Books one two and three of the fairy queen which I am including on this because the fairy queen is so long and this took me so long to read but I didn't read the full thing and also on goodreads they are listed as like as separate books book one two three because like they're long and sorry I'm cheating by talking about it I'm deciding to count it because I spent so long reading the fairy queen and it feels like it's a full book. This is a very famous allegory arguably the first um the first allegory is it, it ended up informing and influencing so many future texts. Like, people dedicate their whole lives to studying this this poem, uh, this extended allegory, and um, William Hazlitt says, with allegory, it's, it's all about play, and it's about meddling with it, and that you create meaning just through trying to find the meaning, and it definitely was fun when I was reading it to do, like, proper close reading of a few tiny sections and really just try and read meaning into it. That's a fun activity, like the close reading that this allows is exceptional. I read Selected Poems by Caroline Duffy. Caroline Duffy is one of my favourite poets. Again, if you're wanting to get into poetry, I'd really recommend this. Um, though I would say her feminist gospels is by far my favourite. Battle of Alcazar by George Peel. This is again an early modern play that I read for my course. Okay, then Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Oh my goodness, by V.E. Schwab. I had been recommended this so many times and I kept on seeing it more to stones and thinking yes I'll read that I'll read that took it out of the library and um it took me about a week to read it to take me quite a long time but I read it so slowly and I know that there are very there are, there are lots of mixed opinions on this book some people love it some people hate it some people despise the ending I loved the ending like I loved it I thought they did it so well but um the general premise is this woman Addie LaRue in 17th century France makes a deal with the devil with Faust with this demon and um says that she will do anything in order to see the world and in order to not be kept captive by marriage because it's you know on her wedding day that she that she calls him up and says I need help I need I need a way out of this and um so she's given um eternal life eternal time but but the, there's a caveat and that's that nobody will ever remember her so as soon as somebody turns away they will forget that she existed and um it's this I mean like the idea is just exceptional like 
wow what an idea so it's kind of split between her when she makes the pact like going chronologically and then her in the present day new york they're kind of put side by side and um it's reckoning with like what does it mean for someone to be innocent what does it like the same questions that we get in like picture of dorian gray because she stays in her early 20s for the whole of this period the really big thing is exploring her relationship with um faust and how um that changes over time and how they kind of fall in love um but what's the nature of that relationship it's just i mean like the 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 writing is also exquisite it's beautifully done um i love the fact that um it kind of champions uh, what it means to be a muse can we discount especially in older art like um victorian or pre-victorian can we discount like kind of the muse as um a song with artistic agency and um this book is really questioning what it means to be an active muse and um yeah i just loved it it was so good then I read The Imitation of the Rose by Clarice Lyspector. I'd had so many good things about Lyspector's work. It's it's a beautifully indulgent read and it's very introspective so it's it's a calming thing to read and the kind of thing which is perfect to read on a Sunday afternoon. But I don't know, I feel like I definitely want to try something else by her because I thought I would love it and I liked it but I would only have, I only gave it like three stars so I definitely want to try something else by her and let me know in the comment section if you're a if you're a fan of her work what i should read because um i know that she's excellent and i think i will like her but i just this 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 really wasn't this really didn't kind of impress me as much as i was expecting it to i finally read the third book in a good girl's guide to murder the series as good as dad by holly jackson good girl's guide to murder is my favorite way book so why on earth i hadn't read this i don't know but um did not disappoint it was a fantastic end to the trilogy i love how um pip really kind of there are questions about um what it means to be moral what it means to be good what it means to be innocent and jackson is really playing with those questions in this book much more than in the others and playing with like pip's guilt and it it's 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 harrowing it's definitely the heaviest of the books um in that series then i read sarah werner's studying early printed books 1450 to 1800 it's a practical guide to um to printing and printmaking and if you are interested to learn about early modern printing this is definitely the book to read because it's so like it's really easy to access um but it covers everything and it's just the best introduction i'm so glad that i read this before starting my course I also read the Cambridge Introduction to Shakespeare by Emma Smith. Again, I was sponsored for this by um, Cambridge University Press. This is a great option for anyone who is getting started with studying Shakespeare. And let's say that you're about to do your undergraduate or um, you're about to start like a Shakespeare module, um, then I would definitely recommend this. Though, honestly, even for people further on in their studies, like, I actually really enjoyed reading this right before my course started. There, it's separated into like different sections and um, it draws on key critical debates which have been happening in scholarship. So um, like ideas of doubling on the early modern stage, for example, that was a really good essay that I liked in that. Um, and it's edited by Emma Smith. Um, I also read The Jew of Malta by Christopher Marlowe. Then I read How I Live Now by Meg Rossoff. I watched the film of this ages ago. My sister's friend's actually in this film and I've been meaning to read it for ages, but I hadn't. It's definitely YA and definitely younger YA reminded me of holly black's books that kind of style it feels verbal you know kind of it feels like you're talking to somebody it feels like you're listening to someone thinking a teenager thinking um and that's a really hard voice i think to crack this girl goes to live with some family in england and while she's there a war breaks out and um she is kind of stuck in this house with her cousins and it's only these children and it's about how their lives change. Then Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Miro. I again had heard good things about this. It's set in Edinburgh and London and it's you know proper Victoriana uh, setting. I'm not a big fan of high fantasy and it was just tipping into too much high fantasy for me to like it but I love the setting, the writing is great. Like at, as a whole I, I did really like it and there were moments that I loved it but then there were a few parts that I just didn't like so much and I think that clouded my overall perception of the book. It was quite a long book as well, I will say. It's nearly 700 pages, so it's quite a it's quite a big book. I reread The Great Gatsby this year. I forgot that I reread The Great Gatsby. That was such a fun one to reread. I love The Great Gatsby. 
Um, American Primitive by Mary Oliver, it's the first full collection of her poems that I'd read. Um, I read kind of like one-offs of her poems and I see them everywhere and I love her work so much. Overall there weren't that many poems in this collection that I personally really liked but that's not a reason for you not to read it. My favourites of her poems aren't in this collection. Then The Lost Spells by Robert McGarflane. I'm gonna show you this because here. My grandma lent me this and I haven't returned it yet. I really need to return it. It's an art book. Look at those illustrations. It's just stunning. And it's basically poems um, which are related to, to different animals. So um, Gannet Glide, Stiffed Wing, Sharp Hide, Path Cliff, Past Cliff and Stack. A perfect paper aeroplane, all angles, creases, points. Next moment without warning, Gannet hinges, folds, plunges into calm sea. And they're just, I love nature poetry so much. And the illustrations are a beautiful addition. Um, this would be a really great gift book for anybody or a gift to yourself if you're in need of a good self-care night. On the nature theme still, I read The Wisdom of Trees, a miscellany um, by Max Adams, which is a combination of writings about trees, but also facts about trees. And you get to learn so much about trees, which I loved. Clara and the Sun by Ishiguro. Um, I was really, I was recommended this. Um, I like the premise of it more than the actual thing. So Clara is an artificial friend um, and she's this sort of robot who's, it starts with her in a shop and she's waiting for a child to choose her as a friend and take her home. Um, so it's grappling with questions of artificial intelligence, what it means to be human, what does it mean to kind of be conscious, um, the same, those same kinds of questions that we get in Never Let Me Go. I love the first half of it but I feel like the second half drifted from the questions that I was interested in. This is worth reading though, it is worth reading. I feel like the tone changes a lot in the second half and I don't know if that's because Clara changes and she's evolving, but I just didn't like the voice as much in the second half. Small Things Like This by Claire Keegan, such a beautiful sensitivity to small moments, domestic moments and connections. The Wonder by Emma Donoghue is about a fasting girl in I want to say 15th century Ireland. It was quite common actually. You'd have these um, young girls who wouldn't eat but claim to be surviving off the manner of God and often their stories would be recorded and published and circulated and people would visit and um, ask for kind of like prophecies from God and advice, advice from God. It, this is narrated by a nurse who goes up to visit this girl and um, is tasked with sitting in the room and seeing how it is that she has been surviving. An interesting conversation between science and religion set, in a t set at a time where those were very much at odds and kind of fighting against each other. I'm gonna try and speed through these a little bit more quickly now. Sorry, because I'm realizing that I just have so many books still to go through. I'm sorry, this is me being lazy, but I don't want this video to be too long. Next was Genuine Fraud by E. Lockhart, who also published We Were Liars. This is very similar to The Talented Mr. Ripley. It's kind of a spin-off of that. It's about a girl who has stolen a friend's identity. Enigma Variations by Andre Asman is a collection of short stories. Andre Asman also wrote Call Me By Your Name, and I love his writing style so much. Um, this is completely unconnected to the Call Me By Your Name universe or kind of those storylines but there is also there is one set in Italy which is um very similar in style and general atmosphere this really isn't my favorite thing that I've read, read by him I love Asiman's writing style so much that I did enjoy reading this but it's my least favorite thing I've read by him and over this I would recommend Find Me which is the sequel to Call Me By Your Name which lots of people do not like but I thought was quite good The White Book by Han Kang was brilliant. I'm sure I've raved about this in a video before. Um, basically every page is a different, it's like a, not even, not even a love letter, but just um, a celebration of the colour white. And every page talks about a different 
white object which was influential in the author's life and kind of linking it to like childhood memory etc it's, it's really clever and i've never read anything like it and also han kang's writing as we know is just exceptional why you should read children's books even though you are so old and wise by Catherine rundle this is a very short essay by the children's writer Catherine rundle um about why children's literature is actually really important OK Days by Jenny Mustard, um, heard so much about this online of course. I feel like OK Days does what normal people was trying to do but didn't do. I didn't like normal people. Capturing a very real relationship between two people um, and I especially love how this is formatted because um, it kind of, it's like a countdown so it, start, it goes like 50 days, 48 days, 39 days, beginning of every chapter and you don't know what it's counting down to but you've got this slow build through that which is a really interesting formal decision. Shy by Max Porter. Max Porter is my favourite living writer. His work is just, I love how experimental it is, how it doesn't ascribe to genre, how it's not trying to ascribe to genre, how it's not trying to ascribe to kind of traditional ways of format. Shy thinks about kind of toxic masculinity among teenage boys. It's about a boy with depression in the 90s and how he's kind of wronged by a wider societal system. And Porter kind of puts that in contrast to... Um, his sensitivity. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. I started this three or four years ago and this has been on my t TBR since I was about 15. It was one of the big classics I really wanted to read and I just kept on like starting it and then putting it to one side, not finishing it. Um, I'm really glad I finally got around to doing it though. A ghost story but also again like with The Hauntings, not a traditional ghost story. Um, it's kind of playing with science versus myth, uh, these questions that were so prevalent in the Victorian period. It kind of starts with this man on uh, on a road at in the dark and he sees this mysterious woman cloaked all in white and doesn't know who she is and the whole book is trying to figure out her identity basically and it's done in a very similar uh, format to uh, Dracula or also Frankenstein where it's told through letters and diary entries. The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern now, okay, I really didn't like this. I can see why people love it because I love the writing style and I've read like extracts of The Night Circus before and I thought I'd adore it because I love the writing style, but I just, I feel like it works better as descriptive writing and I like reading it more as tiny sections of prose and almost like poetry as opposed to a wider novel format. I just couldn't, I just couldn't get into the story and um, I love the premise but I just couldn't get into the story. Measure for Measure by Shakespeare. This one was actually banned. It was left out of the family Shakespeare in the Victorian period. Then Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. These are all books that I actually read in a readathon. Then I read The Miseducation of Cameron Post. This is about a girl who is sent to a gay conversion camp and um, the really striking thing about this book is that it literally feels like two separate books. You start over over the course of a few years and these beautiful relationships that um, Cameron has, um, these kind of languid, beautifully written summers and then the second half is her in the conversion camp and the style is so different. Really interesting shift. The Last Tycoon by F. Scott Fitzgerald I also read. Oh, this was his last novel and it wasn't ever finished so it was left unfinished and I definitely think you can see that in relation to his other work. It's obviously still good but just in relation to Fitzgerald it's not the best so I wouldn't recommend reading this as your first Fitzgerald because it might put you off. Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang was one of the best books I read this year of course it's going to be in my top 10. Exploring racism in the publishing industry and using Kuang's own experiences and uh, kind of uh, observations of the industry in order to in order to create that. Just the things that the narrator does, she's awful. Um, and in the same way as a book like Lolita, Kuang is able to get you kind of at points to empathise with her. And at points you find yourself empathising with, with the narrator and then you're like, what on earth am I doing? She's awful. And that is a real skill, like to, to do that, to do what, um, what Nabokov was able to do in Lolita, like so worth reading. Three Men in a Boat by Jerome Jerome. Very male narrative, but also so funny and a great one to read in the summer. The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I reread. I love The Secret Garden um, and this idea of magic being so linked to the countryside and growth and nature as opposed to something fantastical, like redefining what it means for something to be magic. Terms and Conditions. 
Uh, Life in Girls Boarding Schools from 1939 to 1979 draws on a series of interviews and testimonies of um, girls who went to these boarding schools and puts together a guide to what life was like. Um, and I learned so much from this. It's actually my second time reading that one. I finally read Maurice by Ian Forster, uh, a beautiful love story, but also so like just so heartbreaking and so sad. It's set partially in Cambridge and it's between these two men. Uh, they meet as undergraduates and um, the Edwardian contexts in which they live mean that it, it casts this awful like dramatic irony and sadness over the whole book. I read Poetry in the Making, a catalogue of exhibition of an exhibition of poetry manuscripts by Philip Larkin. I read this while I was at Arvon and it doesn't sound that riveting. It was basically Philip Larkin writing about an exhibition of poetry manuscripts and highlighting the importance of seeing manuscripts of poetry in the flesh and how you can see revisions to the work and how it can help you understand the poetry in a better way. I'm really interested in archival studies and manuscript studies, so this was really interesting to read. The Sincere Huron uh, by Voltaire, which I didn't really like, um, which I feel bad saying because obviously Voltaire is one of the great philosophers, um, but I just didn't like it. I read Candide by Voltaire like just a couple days ago and I, I just don't really like Voltaire's style. Um, he uses fiction to explore his philosophy, which is always fun because um, fiction is largely a form of philosophy. Voltaire's work is very absurdist, like adventure narrative. Householder by Gerard Woodward is a collection of poems and I loved this. This was great. Uh, domestic poetry. Nettle Eater by Tom Hirons was so good. This was only 26 pages, but it's this surrealist, um, absurd uh, kind of almost mythical like witchy um pamphlet about um this man who decides to leave civilization and go and live in the wilderness for a year and eat nettles like survive off nettles and he falls into this bout of madness which is just i mean it's excellent and no one talks about this but it's so worth reading oh my gosh i'm actually getting tired as well my mouth is tired i feel like i'm talking so much so all of these books I have actually fully reviewed on my channel because I did monthly roundups. So if you want a full review, then definitely go to those videos um, because I'll just be repeating myself. And also it's, also it's been about six months since I've read these books now um, and I do remember them, but I will have given a better review six months ago when the book was still fresh and I remember the details. What tends to happen, um, I've, I find at least like People ask me often, do you remember everything you read? And no, I don't remember everything I read. Um, in the same way that we don't remember every single thing that happens to us on an ordinary day. Um, but I remember I there are kind of key things that I take away from books. So I, I read a book five years ago and there'll be key things that I will remember about it. The things like key images, key moments, key maybe life lessons, um, but I won't remember every single detail. Little by Edward Carey was brilliant. It's the story of the woman who started Madame Tussauds in London and so it charts her right from her birth to um, her death heads, how she learned to make, make wax heads um, as an apprentice and uh, it also goes through her time in the French Revolution. The Art of Poetry of Horace. Um, I just, when I was doing reading for uh, my masters. This just kept on coming up and I realised I had to read it because it's cited so much. The Problem That Has No Name by Bre Betty Friedan is um, an essay about the dissatisfaction that women felt in like the 50s and 60s. The ideal of um, life at home and being this ideal housewife and kind of this, this, this was sold so much to women and then Friedan says that this is the problem that has no name. She says that they're can end up being a lack of satisfaction but everything but they're told that everything is perfect and so this problem has no name. Darkness at Noon is very heavy, it's set in a state which is at war and um, this man who used to be an advisor to the government to, to prolong this kind of suffering of civilians, um, suddenly he's implicated and he's imprisoned and he's being questioned, very much like Animal Farm with Snowball. Cambridge and Newspapers, uh, an alternative medium during the early modern period, um, is about 
handwritten newspapers and the transition from handwritten newspapers to print newspapers. I really love this actually, um, it's thinking about the relationship between letters and newspapers, which I never thought of before. I read Guardians of Magic by Chris Riddell. Chris Riddell is my favourite illustrator. He is just the most incredible person ever. And the Guardians of Magic series draws on classic images from children's stories and fairy tales and takes those characters and those tropes and then puts it into a new narrative, which is so fun for kids. They get to see intertextuality and they get to play with intertextuality and see, you know, one of the characters is very much like Alice. You've got the Pied Piper in this. I just love the absurdity of his children's books. The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnim is about a group of women who rent a villa in Italy for a month and uh, kind of escape from their lives in London. All of them are very different and they come to the experience very different, but it's um, kind of about the relationship that they form there. And the writing is just beautiful. It's um, like the peak cottage core. Don't Look Now and Other Stories, I read this one in Venice because one of the short stories is set in Venice. Um, these short stories are creepy though, like really creepy, but imbued with the wonderful gothic, which is signature to De Maria's work. A Horse at Night on Writing, these essays about the process of writing. I love how it's not a strict prescriptive guide on how to write, but rather it's filled with questions and she never claims to know the answer. She's saying more, is this how this works? And it involves the reader and um, the perspective writer um, and turns it into a conversation which I've never seen in a book like this. I also read Foster by Claire Keegan. I said that I read small things like this, these uh, later in the year. Foster, um, I preferred to small things like these. It's about a girl who her mother sends her away to some family friends for the summer because she's about to have a child, another child and she can't handle having that many children in the house and um, it's about this single one summer which she spends with this older couple and how she feels loved for really the first time. It's heartbreaking and really and tenderly done and carefully done and you can see why this book made her so popular. The Man in the Picture by Susan Hill is also one that I read in Venice. It's set in Venice. Well, it's kind of set in Venice. It's about a painting in Venice. Um, so this man in Oxford, this done in Oxford, has this painting of the carnival of a carnival in venice like the venetian carnival it's kind of thinking about the relationship between art and real life and how a painting interacts in a very real way with the real world um it's very spooky very creepy uncanny i recommended this to two of my colleagues and they both read it in like a day or two it's really really quick death in venice by thomas mann there is a theme here i was in venice and i wanted to read books set in venice it was my second time reading it and it's about, again, questions of the muse, what it means for someone to be a muse. Um, this man goes on holiday to Venice and becomes obsessed by this 14 year old boy and thinks of him as this archetype of beauty and um, the whole story is him becoming obsessed with him. It's a story of obsession and uncomfortable obsession. Going through all of these Venice books, I realised that I completely forgot to say that I read Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare. This is actually quite a good play to think about or read alongside The Jew of Malta by Christopher Marlowe. Both of them are exploring anti-Semitism in early modern England. Shylock is of course one of the most notorious villains in Shakespeare. Especially interesting are the themes of conversion in this play with Shylock's daughter, um, which is a trope that we see coming up again and again in early modern plays. Like in The Island Princess, for example, we see something very similar with Quizara, who converts to Christianity. So if you're interested in those themes, if you're interested in presentations of the Abrahamic religions in the early modern period, then this is a good one to read. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets is a piece of sensationalist Victorian literature, um, very much like the, you know, the Penny Dreadfuls and uh, those stories which were so popular in the Victorian period. I, re I wasn't that much of a fan of it, but if you want to read something to understand that genre better then this is this would be a good thing to read i'm gonna have to take a break because i'm actually like i can't even think straight and i want to give you good reviews of these books but i can't even think straight at the moment so i might go get a cup of tea and come back though it will be dark by the time my next come back so i'm sorry next is lady macbeth ad which is the backstory of lady macbeth this is again one of the best books that i read this year the writing style again beautifully lyrical and i love how she includes these 
tiny references to Shakespeare's play. It's really cleverly done. I read Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. I love Anne Bronte. This is based loosely on Anne's own life. She became a governess when she was in her 20s and this um, and Agnes Grey similarly becomes a governess. You should read this if you liked for that by Charlotte Bronte. Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Warne. It's the book that everyone's comparing to Saltburn at the moment. I think Saltburn was based on this. Um, it's one of the kind of like country summer narratives, very like kind of prolific genre. So it's set partially at Oxford, which is the reason I read it actually. And this friend is taken back to Brideshead, which is this um, extravagant house in the countryside. And the book is basically grappling with the questions of class and what's happening underneath the veneer. I read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I haven't actually watched the new film yet, but I liked this and I really loved the political dimension to The Hunger Games and providing that backstory, which kind of is scarier than the actual thing because you can see how it came about. The Awakening by Kate Chopin. I like what it's doing and it's interesting to talk about, but I didn't enjoy the process of reading this. The, the Awakening is referring to this female enfranchisement and realization of independence. Love what the book is doing but I just don't really like Kate Chopin's writing style personally. My Evil Mother by Margaret Atwood is a short story about motherhood and cycles of motherhood. Mona I'd heard such good things about again um, and I loved this book. There were some graphic scenes in it though, again with it being, I'm sorry to keep on using the word lyrical, I use that a lot, but as I say, it's testament to whether I think something's a good book, because it reads like poetry, this, it's about a woman who's been nominated for this prestigious writing prize, and her and ten other writers are kind of put together in this little woodland community for a week in preparation for the ceremony and it's how each of them interacts and it's just a nice kind of microcosm environment. This book kills also by Ravina Garan who also wrote uh, the Catch or Death book I talked about earlier. Set in a prestigious boarding school where somebody dies and Garan and Skull is trying to figure out who killed her and she's implicated because the way that this uh, child has been murdered it directly ascribes to a short story that she wrote um, in which somebody dies. I read Dakota Warren's On Sun Swallowing. I'm not just saying this because Dakota's lovely and because she's a friend but this was like exquisite. It's the best it's the best anthology of modern poetry that I've read or come across. Akin to Carol Ann Duffy, Mary Oliver, um, themes of girlhood, death, madness, and I love the mass media format, so there are Polaroid pictures, there are annotations, there are marks other than just the typeface, and that's powerful, and it turns it into a sort of exhibition as you're reading. Um, I really liked it, I've dipped into it since. I think it's worth the hype. The Making of a Marchioness uh, by Frances Hodgson Burnett is the first piece of adult writing that I've read by Frances Hodgson Burnett. She also wrote A Little Princess and The Secret Garden, and this is kind of similar honestly in many ways to um a little princess it's kind of got the same structural like formal elements to her children's books it's a rags to riches story and it starts with this woman who very innocent pure kind of very well loved very kind and then she marries and um finds herself very high up in society i liked it and i like her writing but i do prefer her children's books oh i'm getting all these notifications my mum's on a train home, so she's just messaging us to let her let us know where, we, where she is. Um, Demon Voices by Philip Pullman, best thing by Philip Pullman I've read, and also my favourite book of writing that I've read, um, like essays on writing. As I say, I think it's a really hard one to get right, but it, this is a collection of articles and essays and speeches that he's given over the years. I was actually lucky enough to hear him speak when he received his Bodley Medal last month and he's an exceptional speaker like just he he was talking in his speech about um how writers need to be attentive to the materials that they use in the same way that an artist needs to be aware of the quality of paint that they're using the writer needs to hold and kind of be aware of and be careful with the words that they're using and use good words um he uses he uses a series of gorgeous metaphors in order to write about the process of writing and it has that same i want to say sort of whimsical feel or like there's a magic to philip pullman's writing and you get this even here when he's not even writing about like magic like in the his dark materials series the brothers karamazov by dostoevsky moment for this book 
again, this had been on my TBR for ages, of course, and I, I was waiting for a good moment to read it. Um, I'm glad that I waited because if I'd read this when I was 13, 14, I just wouldn't have, I just wouldn't have appreciated it. This is about the three Karamazov brothers and their father dies and nobody knows who has killed him. And so it's a sort of murder mystery, but rather than being plot driven, it's introspective and it's 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 like a it's like a dialogue um it's it's a piece of philosophy and um that's the driving force so you get an insight into the different ways that the brothers think the different ways that they approach the world because of their backgrounds because of their educations because of their interests even though they're brothers even though they've been given a similar upbringing they are so strikingly different in how they approach the world. You, one of the brothers is an intellectual, one of them is a man of God, and one is much more kind of impulsive as a brother. Dimitri is my least favourite. It's, especially in the interact, because they represent such different modes of thought, the interactions and the conversations which are thus able to arise between them, especially since they're close, they could have like good conversations, they're not surface level conversations. Um, this book is so worth reading that I would recommend kind of waiting for a good time to read it um, and really relishing it and taking it slowly. Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album is a book about grief and it's, um, it's non-fiction actually. A man visits his old university professor who's dying and he's given a last lecture series um, but they're lectures on how to live well and what it means to live a good life and every Tuesday he visits Maury and he's given this lesson on how to live. It coincides with Maury getting progressively ill and um, it's just, it's so tender, it's it's beautiful and it uh, gives you an insight into life. The Captain and the Glory, an entertainment by Dave Eggers. Dave Eggers also wrote The Circle. This is an absurdist piece of writing and so different to anything I've read before. It looks like a children's book, but it's not a children's book. I will just put that out there. There is some, um, it's like, it's all, it's all satire. I read Avoid. Oh wait, oh my gosh, oh yeah, Avoid. This is a book which is written entirely without the letter E. So clever, that's the reason I read it. The actual story itself isn't, I mean, isn't particularly, particularly gripping. It's a classic whodunit book, but, um, the fact that the whole thing is able to take place without the letter E is just exceptional and it's um, it's artful to be able to read. High Windows by Philip Larkin, collection of poems, first one by Larkin that I've read, um, particularly great poems on ideas of growing old, what it means to grow old. I'm looking at this and I'm like, did I read all of these books this year? Because it feels like it's been ages since I read these. I've still got so many left. What? Okay, Babel and Arcane History, I'm so glad that I read this this year. Um, and I kind of want to reread it now because it's set in an alternative Oxford in the Victorian period and um, it follows a group of students who are trained in translation, but it's a different kind of translation and there's a kind of like magical realism element to their studies, um, which you figure out over the course of the book. And it's deconstructing the academic institution, the problems with that and the colonialist roots of academia. Lyra's Oxford, Philip Pullman, it's a short story which accompanies the His Dark Materials series. If you like His Dark Materials you should definitely dip into these. Um, I also read The Collectors this year which is another of those but Lyra's Oxford is the better one. The Family Cast Field Notebooks by Tenacity, Tenacity Plus. Again this was for a sponsored video. Always so bizarre when I say that a book review is sponsored um, but just for reference I would not take a sponsorship for a book if I didn't like it because that feels unethical. The views are still very much my own. This is a layered narrative, I love a good layered narrative. It's about changelings, it's about fairies, it's dark. Yeah and it's, it's good if you want something gothic and you want something short because it's also quite short. Gen Z explained the art of living in a digital age. I read this because I was on a panel which followed the launch of this book. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, it's a great piece of research but definitely more aimed at people who aren't Gen Z. A Place Called Perfect by Helena Duggan. Fairly good middle grade book. I love the premise. It's a world, world where everyone wears these glasses, which are literally rose tinted and they make um, this village that they live in look absolutely perfect, even though it's not. On the Pleasure of Hating by William Hazlitt. Loved this, one of the best essays I've read. It's a very cynical worldview and I don't ascribe to it, but it's well written, it's funny, it's satirical, and it's also very relevant given the prevalence of hate online and a cultural bias, especially 
in the digital age towards hating and a kind of and a pleasure in hating. I recommended this to Blakeney actually the other day and she bought it when we were in Daunt. I read King Lear by William Shakespeare. King Lear, oh, Cordelia is one of my favourite characters in Shakespeare. I think Shakespeare's plays on fatherhood are my favourite and the ending of this is just, you will be crying. I really want to see it in performance now. I read Barrick's British Bird, really important at the time and it gives information about different birds along with these wonderful sketches. Obviously not recent research but a very important book at the time. Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Interesting book and I'm glad that I've read it because now I can pick up on references to it but I did not enjoy reading this. The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis is very similar to the TV show. If you really love the TV show I'd recommend reading it because it gives you another chance to relive the show but it's so similar that if you were just impartial to the show this probably isn't worth reading. It's they're, they're basically parallel. It's one of the best adaptations that I've seen in that they are near identical. Selected poetry of Alexander Pope. First time properly reading Pope. The Wolves of Willoughby Chase. Um, this is one of Blakely's favourite books when she was young and she lent me her copies that I had to read it. So glad that I did. It takes all of the key tropes of children's literature and puts them together in one book. I don't even know how she managed to do it but it's really great if you are a fan of children's literature. The Monstrous Child by Fran Francesca Simon is about hell, like she's the goddess of hell. She's a teenager when she's sent down to guard the underworld and she's morally flawed, deeply morally flawed, which is always fun to see in a character, especially in a middle grade book. It's also using Norse mythology which is fun. I did read Spare by Prince Harry because Everyone was talking about it and I, I thought that this book would end up being really influential and I, I was wondering how it might end up affecting um, the monarchy and so I wanted to read it so that I'd just be more informed. Um, contrary to what so many reviews say online, it doesn't read as an attack on the monarchy, at least I didn't read it as an attack on the monarchy, it's much more an attack on the press. Uh, the Collectors, which I mentioned. King of Shadows by Susan Cooper, about a boy who travels back in time and performs in the first production of A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare. The world building here and the level of research into Jacobi in England is fantastic. I would even go as far as to recommend this to university students just just to dip into because um, it gives it really it really does build the world well. A kind of spark, a middle grade book, a great way of educating kids on autism and what autism looks like in girls because so often when we talk about autism we talk about it in relation to boys and autism in girls and boys is very different. Reading it as an adult it did feel quite clunky because at times it was just listing certain like aspects of, of, of autism uh, like meltdowns and overstimulation, uh, stimming but that's but I realise it's clunky because I know about autism. Um, this is a really important book for middle grade kids to read and I would really recommend it to if you've got any younger siblings or you work as a teacher and you work in a school. Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. I reread this year. I hadn't read it since I was 12. 12 was way too young to read Wuthering Heights. I did not get much from it and um, I remember not really liking it that much. Still, First Generation Kathy hugely annoys me which takes the edge off the first half of the book for me even though I love the writing, I love the atmosphere. Emily Bronte's writing is so atmospheric, so gothic, her descriptions of the moors are just unparalleled. When I was in um, Yorkshire this year I listened to the audiobook as I was walking up to the um, the house, like Heathcliff's house, the house which uh, the house the house which she based Heathcliff's cottage off. Um, but yeah, first generation Kathy is just kind of frustrating. Um, but the thing I love about Wuthering Heights is this idea that anyone is lovable, a anyone is capable of love. Kathy and Heathcliff are both deeply flawed and yet they love each other unconditionally. And then the first book I read of this year was Five Survived by Holly Jackson. Um, I did a readathon with Blakeney in my parents' camp van and it went viral randomly. The whole book is set in real time and so it should take you eight hours to read and it takes place over the course of eight hours. There's a shooter and these six teenagers are stuck in a van in the middle of nowhere and one of them has a secret and if they can find out the secret then um, the shooter will just take that one person as opposed to all of them. It's very good, it's very intense. But there we go, those are all of the books that I read this year. And my top 15 books in no particular order are The Brothers Karamazov, Babel, Yellow Face, Demon Voices, On Sun Swallowing, Brideshead Revisited, Lady Macbeth Ad, Little the Natalita, The White Book, 
The Invisible Life of Adi LaRue, The Renaissance by Walter Pater, Notes from Up the Underground, The Grave, and Incurable by Lionel Johnson. Honestly, it's such good books this year. I can't get over how many good books I read this year. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm sure it's very long. I'm honestly exhausted. Like, I don't think I've ever been this exhausted after filming a video. Um, but I did read some excellent books this year and I hope that you've walked away with maybe one or two books to add to your TBR or maybe like a couple dozen. Um, I always end up with a long list after watching videos like this. Um, but yeah, thank you again to Ritual for sponsoring today's video. Um, as I say, there is a discount in the description box if you want to check that out, and I hope that you have more than just a productive week. Mm -hmm.